put together a week-long peace fair on Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. It's the 10th anniversary, and the resolution has not been fully implemented. So we've brought together the voices of women and men from all over the world to say how they've used 1325 and what they still need for its full implementation. As the voice of civil society is loud and clear, we want peace women at every peace table. In order to prevent rape during war, we have to prevent war and we need the participation of women at every level of governance. So there's no excuse for the UN, for the Secretary General, for the Security Council, not to implement it. Because if it's good for women, it's good for everyone. strengthen and implement Security Council Resolution 1325. We're here because we want to put peace women at peace tables. We want to call on the Secretary General to implement this watershed resolution throughout the UN system and appoint a liaison to keep him and the UN accountable. 1325 came from the women's movement. It goes back to the wars of Rwanda and Kosovo, to the Declaration of Windhoek, to civil society organizations, including International Alert and the Hague Appeal for Peace Conference in 1999. It calls for the prevention of violence. It is, it's a disarmament resolution. To protect women from rape, we need to regulate and reduce weapons. <laughs> Helen Clark is the administrator of the face and voice of the UN in almost all the member states. Fundamental truths that lasting peace will not be achieved without having women properly represented in peace processes and that the full and effective implementation of 1325 overall will not be realised without the active participation of civil society. But too often still we are seeing women subject to sexual violence as a method of war. Too often impunity prevails where crimes go unpunished and continue unabated after a conflict is over. So, as a nation who strongly believes that a lot more remains to be done. A lot has been done globally and nationally to raise awareness on, uh, on women's peace and security issues. However, the realization of peace and security for women in Sierra Leone in particular remains um, um, a debatable uh, engagement. prevention and uh, protection and uh, the promotion of the gender perspective. A fair is generally for fun and fanfare, but this one is more for fairness, justice and equality for women. That is something that the Security Council Resolution 1325 aims to assert and achieve. Therefore, I have the honor to declare 1325 a common heritage of humanity, wherein the global objectives of peace, equality, and development are reflected in a uniquely historic universal document of the United Nations. Thank you. Hi, I'm 
Sana Mandarini. Um, I'm the executive director of the International Civil Society Action Network, ICANN. And I'm here today because 10 years ago, with my friend Cora, uh, we were involved in drafting 1325, the resolution from the Security Council, from the civil society side. We're going to take our message directly to the heart of the UN. It's great to see so many turning up to make uh, women very visible. There's something very appropriate about today being with women on the ground who need to be resourced, who need to be listened to, who need to be participated, who need to be protected. So let's go together. Nothing is small enough for Security Council. We are at the head of a walk to the UN Security Council today to listen to governments tell us how they are going to live up to their commitments. Women together for peace and freedom! Women together for peace and freedom! Everybody is walking in, they're going to go through security and into the room where the Security Council is meeting to begin the debates. We're going to just sit there and listen and, and see which pieces we pick up and, and who's saying really serious things and um, keep you posted. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Women need allies. In nonviolence philosophy, we talk about the need to build allies. Women need male allies. So we need to really enlarge the pool of men that support us in our work. We are trying to work in a feminist framework was frequently not very welcomed by women. And even like in terms of an identity, what kind of political identity do we have is can we be feminists because we're men? Because we, we're actually standing up for women's rights. This is what we're fighting for. Or can we not be? And so this position towards women was very, is very delicate. It's a very, it's a, I think one has to tread very carefully. We live in societies where, as women, we face some very harsh social constructions. Social constructions that keep us out of peace building roles. At the same time, men also face very harsh social constructions. There is a huge pressure also on men to solve conflict through the use of violence. As a young man, it's important to change that. And it's important to, uh, and standing up for that, to say that this concept of allies, I think, is a, is a really, really valuable concept. So we organized a training of trainers where we brought 19 men together who represent 17 peace networks in the world. So men, we really wanted men who are in an influential position. Men who work in civil society for peace, who work on national level, some on regional level. Men who can have an influence. Men that other men will listen to. We definitely spoke about all the different kinds of violences, sexual violences, gender-based violences. But we also talked about sexualities, the positive aspects of relationships, empathy, compassion. Uh, we did a lot of, I think, re uh, relational work as well. And the most interesting subject to me in terms of working with the men was, was teaching feminisms. There are a lot of men out there who want to uh, be allies with women, but some of them are, are uh, unsure, like, okay, how? <laughs> we think this, this TUT is part of, of developing and fostering partnerships between uh, women and men and creating understanding on how you could work together as well. When men came back for the second time, they were completely different men. It, I cannot tell you, it was unbelievable. The problem is, and as you have pointed out, is for men to understand why they should take another look at the way they've been socialized which can lead to violence against women. Obviously, you're, you're, you're telling a lot of young men, reject everything that you've been told about being a man, and everything that you're being told 150 times a day through media, through 
all kinds of images, and also not just being told by men, but being told by women. We need to um, include religious leaders because they're really very important in our communities, and people listen to them very much. So it is a problem that affects everyone. That's why I think you know it's good for all of us, men and women, to understand that in this we need to be together. We need to be all of us. Let us create uh, a humanity with, which is gender sensitive, also gender neutral. What started off as we want prevention as in prevention of war has been distilled into prevention of sexual violence. And we need to get back to prevention of war because we can't have prevention of sexual violence being done very well if we're having wars break out. I think it's time that we had a 1325 test for every troop contributing country that deploys soldiers to peacekeeping missions. And that 1325 test has to be passed by every foot person and every hire person before they can be deployed. The year 2000 was a, a critical year. The resolution in itself became a centerpiece of the whole movement, not only again women, but also men. Even among the allies of 1325, um, there has been a limited capacity to imagine it, what it looks like when it has legs and arms and lives in the real world. So media is a really critical piece of how to move forward. The payoff for media may be a long-term thing. It may take me a year and a half to get something finished, but the, the changes that really matter are the ones that are slowest and deepest and hardest to accomplish. That film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, should be shown to the Security Council to the General Assembly or wherever, because they still don't believe that women can do something. They don't understand the power of women. And along with explicitly stating this as a priority, the UN can incorporate uh, gender consideration and increase its visibility through some of the following steps. First, by including it in their regular reporting on Cyprus. Uh, second, they can encourage and strengthen the local UN mission to take greater responsibility for an action on gender issues. And of course, allocating greater human and financial resources for this is also required. The destruction of families, she has seen through that. And she says that even now in the transitional time, uh, women still do not have, uh, you know, don't, do not feel secure. The main concern is um, that they need to feel secure and access to justice because nothing is being done. And that's their main concern. And also economic empowerment, rebuilding their lives. What kind of support can be given? That is what is the main concern in the transitional time. And she says, unless and until uh, women are given economic empowerment, uh, access to justice, 1325 has no meaning for them. We can't solve problems with military structures. We've got to get into a mode and a culture of nonviolence.